Well, good afternoon, everyone, <clears throat> and welcome to our session. I'm June Hinton. I'm Dean of the College of Human Sciences at Auburn University, and I'm del delighted this afternoon to have an outstanding panel of uh, five individuals who are working through their respective organizations to address our topic of the hour, uh, which is building mentally resilient youth. So we've come here together this afternoon to explore this um, concept of resilience a bit further, discussing how to foster a next generation of well-adjusted, happy, healthy adults. And we hope to have just a couple of minutes at the end of the session, if all goes well, to have time for questions. So be thinking about that and be ready to, to join in. So to kick this off and just sort of get all of us on the same page, let's just start with the assumption that the sheer process of growing up is, by definition, a tough process, brings significant challenges personally and interpersonally. And this is true really for all kids, I think, but I think it's especially true for at-risk youth those who have been um, exposed to patterns of discrimination, such as race, uh, ethnicity, uh, sexual orientation, but also those who are um, facing some kind of trauma or biological uh, risk as well. It's also true for those kids who just don't have the disposition, the skill set, or the support system to easily ride the wave of these stressful situations when they occur. And the stressors can in, include just a wide variety of things, and you're going to be hearing about that from all of the panelists this afternoon. But it can be anything from developmental deficiencies to anxiety and depression, family or peer concerns, academic performance, relationship problems, and a myriad of other things that we might name including things like the opioid crisis, suicide, and gun violence. The capacity to adapt to those kinds of disturbances in the lives of these youth is what we call resilience. It's a complex construct that develops not only as a result of the relationships that these youth build, which start with caregiver, child attachment, moves on through identity formation, but it also is influenced by internal systems of individuals, such as stress regulation or immune function. And these internal systems may in turn be affected by other external systems, like food and nutrition security, adequate sleep and exercise, and even predictability of routine day to day, just to name a few. So clearly, when you look at this concept, it's a, an extremely multifaceted concept. But I would say that the good news is this. We are learning more about resilience every day. We um, have better research methods to deal with it. And we know that there are any number of effective interventions that can be used to promote resiliency. So let's hear about what some of these interventions are. Uh, we're going to start with our panelists and know that the approaches that they take and the experiences that they ha have had with these youth are going to be very enlightening. Sherry Weston, you're up first. Okay. Sherry is president of Global Impact and Philanthropy for Sesame Workshop, the nonprofit educational organization behind Sesame Street. So Sherry, tell us a little bit more about Sesame Workshop, the work you do, and your philosophy for helping kids navigate their way through tough times. Okay, I'd be delighted, thank you so much. Um, well, I'm sure everyone here knows Sesame Street. I won't ask for a show of hands, but, uh, <laughs> but I would bet that many of you don't know the depth and breadth of Sesame's work. And you know, as you mentioned, it's a nonprofit. A lot of people don't know that, always has been. It was started with the Ford Foundation, Carnegie Corporation, and Department of Education as an experiment 50 years ago this year mm -hmm. to see if television could be used to teach, but more importantly, could it give less advantaged children some of the same advantages by arriving at school ready to learn? 
Um, we're also not just domestic. We are global, creating local adaptations of Sesame in Afghanistan, Bangladesh, India, you name it. Um, we're not just television. We create media, all forms of media to reach children, but also educational content for schools, for home visitations, um, teacher trainings. So it, it really is, we're great creators of educational content. I think another thing people think of when they think of Sesame Street is ABCs. And certainly, um, that was sort of a demonstrable skill from watching Sesame Street, but it's always been based on a whole child curriculum. And we know that the social and emotional skills are as important for a child to thrive as the academic basics. Um, we, our mission is to help children everywhere grow smarter, stronger, and kinder. Sounds like a great marketing tagline, but it's so true. It's smarter in literacy and numeracy, stronger in resilience, um, health, kinder in respect for difference, differences, empathy. So we also, um, I think you would think of Sesame Street as for kids, and I'll come back to this later, but Sesame Street has always been um, deliberately created to appeal to adults as well. Because even 50 years ago, Joan Gantz Cooney, who was the, the uh, creator of Sesame Street, believed that if adults were watching with a child, the learning would be deeper and it would go off screen. Now we have the science to prove that. Um, but I think you, if you think back, we've always had a long history of tackling tough issues from a child's perspective. When Mr. Hooper died, if anybody grew up watching Sesame Street, he was a character on the show, Mr. Hooper's store, and when the actor who played Mr. Hooper died, um, Joan says they really thought long and hard how to do it. I think most would just recast him, but they didn't, and they did a whole episode around um, the cast explaining to Big Bird that Mr. Hooper had died, that he wasn't coming back. And I think that's just a great example of us dealing with real world issues with um, respect for the child, but directly dealing with it head on. <clears throat> so now, if you fast forward, I mentioned the science. You know, we have the neuroscience to show that the first five years of life are the most important in terms of a child's brain development. We also know that when a child is exposed to chronic stress, to adverse childhood experiences, which I know Nadine will talk about more eloquently than I can, but not just the death, you know, many children will experience the death of a loved one, but I'm talking about um, chronic stress from ongoing situations like a parent who's incarcerated, a parent who um, is addicted, a child who's experiencing homelessness. And so what we've done and what we do is create content that is designed to give the caregivers in their lives, whether it's parents or whether it's social workers, content that helps promote engagement between adult and child. Because what we know is the most important thing to mitigate the literally debilitating um, effect of a child exposed to chronic stress is more engagement with a caring adult. So our philosophy is that we can create content that helps children address tough topics which helps children identify with our characters and our storylines so they feel less alone, but is also giving the adults in their lives the tools and the know-how of how to better help give the children the tools they need to cope and to build the resiliency skills. And the last thing I'll say is, you know, we do a lot of work in the refugee situation. We're working with the IRC to bring early education to Syria, Iraq, Lebanon, and Jordan. It's a huge initiative. Um, and I've spent time in the refugee camps and, and with advisories. We always bring in local advisors to, so that the curriculum is you know, created locally. So we have local advisors as well as our own experts. And I was just in Jordan and Lebanon when we were doing our curriculum seminars. Then last week I was in Chicago where we're doing work to bring Sesame Street and communities into Chicago to help children cope with um, gun violence. And I'm so struck by the fact that if I close my eyes, I could have been in either place. What those advisors are saying those children need is the ABCs of emotion, the language to express their emotions, to identify emotions. And, and you realize that regardless of the context, whether a child's been displaced as a refugee or whether a child is dealing with um, gunshot, I mean, gun violence, which affects their, their well being, the long term physiological impact is the same, even when the contexts are very different. So that's sort of in a nutshell. Fascinating, we'll come back and revisit some of that in just a bit. So um, 
Katie Hood, uh, you're next. Katie is the executive, uh, chief executive officer of One Love Foundation, which focuses on building healthy relationships for the next generation. So will you start, give us a little bit of the background about One Love and tell us who you serve and what you do. Yep, sure, well, I'm so happy to be here. I think this is, I am a mom of four kids under 14 too, so this topic <laughs> is one that I feel very personally every day. Um, and I would say, I guess I'll start with how I got involved. On, on May 3rd, 2010, I was home on maternity leave with my third child when I got a call that said, you need to get to Sharon's house because her cousin's been killed. And I jumped in the car and I drove down the hill and I walked into my close friend's house and she was sitting on the floor with her three small kids around her saying, he broke down the door and he beat her to death. And her cousin was a young woman at the University of Virginia named Yardley Love, who was a lacrosse player who was killed by a fellow lacrosse player. Um, and being a friend of the family, I'll say, they had no idea she was at risk. I was there as they were trying to uncouple what had happened. And, it, and for the first few months, they didn't even think she'd been in an abusive relationship. She was too strong, too confident. She had too many friends. She was not a victim. She was no one's victim. But as the trial approached and they realized that there had been many, many signs, but they'd been coded wrong, clear signs of danger had been called crazy or drama or too much drinking. The kids were talking about those words, but they weren't talking about what it actually was, which was danger and abuse. And therefore, they couldn't bridge to the resources that exist. Then they started to learn about the data that one in three women and one in four men will be in abusive relationships. Young women, 16 to 24, are at three times greater risk than any other demographic. Three women a day are killed by their partners. And no one is really talking about this issue. We see the stories. If you start paying attention, every day you'll read stories about people who are killed. And that's the worst form. But studies have also shown that emotional abuse has a longer-term mental health impact even than physical abuse does. And the rates of emotional abuse are pretty dramatic. I like to say, just so you don't think that I'm preaching, uh, it's not just about emotional abuse. 100% of us will be in unhealthy relationships, and 100% of us will do unhealthy things. So her family really set out to try to solve their specific problem. What would have saved their daughter? They realized that if their friends had been educated, that people could have taken steps to prevent her death. So I'm going to show you, um, and so it's interesting because Sherry and I have known each other for a while, um, and we are sort of in the same business, just different age groups. So content, conversations, empowering peers and first responders to help in a way they've never been able to help before. We're a lot earlier stage. We're about four and a half years into this experiment, but the results are promising. So I'd love to show, if we can, um, the first piece of content, uh, which is called Because I Love You. And um, what we do is we create films that kids relate to to make it easy for them to start talking about a subject that, quite frankly, none of us are that comfortable talking about. Because I love you. Because I love you. Because I love you. Because I love you. This number? Delete. You were walking with Mark? You should know how dumb that makes me look. I don't care if she's your lab partner. Why do you have texts from him? Because I love you. This Jason number? Delete. And, and Ben? Delete. Because I love you, I should smash your phone. You got lucky. Because I love you. That's not love. So the idea was, let's kids love content. Uh, let's create content that introduces new language. Language is a big part of what we do. We actually don't talk about abuse as much anymore. We talk about healthy and unhealthy relationships, because it turns out more people are interested in that subject than abuse and violence. Um, but you can accomplish the same goals, which is teaching the signs and empowering a front line. We've also learned you need to experiment with content. So the next piece, which is um, isolation, I think, which is a couplet, it's humorous, but it still makes the point and gets people talking. They're cute, right? <laughs> I haven't seen you in a couple of days. I've missed you. Aw, I've missed you too. I haven't seen you in five minutes. It feels like a lifetime. <laughs> what have you been doing without me for five whole minutes? It's been three minutes. So these everybody loves, by the way. Who knew when we, we invested in these? But we, these go down to middle school now. And we just did a study where we went back after three months after we did this in Broward County. And the sixth graders could actually describe the individual couplets, the behaviors. And then they said that they were interpreting their own media, thinking about that's love and that's not love. So in media, we're not creating. But when they're on YouTube or on TV or whatever, what's well, exactly what we want to get done? Um, but as we've done this work, we've realized it's not just about preventing what happened to Yardley from happening to others. If you look at the data, and this is the real important connection, I think relationship health is a root cause issue. 
So if you look at the data, relationship health and life outcomes connections are clear. From graduation rates to incarceration rates, mental and physical health, health outcomes, the healthier your relationships, the better you do. And yet we have treated relationships as a soft topic somehow or something that we don't need to teach about. We can learn on the fly. And I think that the, in this world today, where everything is changing about how kids are socializing and learning and they're spending a lot more time on screens where there's benefits to that, they can find community where maybe that community doesn't exist in their proximal location, it also changes how they're learning about building healthy relationships, navigating conflict, et cetera. So we have now sort of pivoted. We're doing the same stuff. We're creating content. We're starting conversations. But we're also increasingly answering kids' number one question is, what does healthy look like? Here's the good news. Most kids want to have healthy relationships. Um, so this is really the direction we're going to go. We think that ultimately, there should, if our country would invest in standardized K through 12 relationship health education, where kids learned at the age appropriate time, the different words that all ladder up to each other, that you're basically giving them a toolkit to carry around with them in life. And when it comes to resilience, it, the studies about abuse show that the more social support you have, the, the less your mental and physical um, health issues are. So why wouldn't we assume it's the same with our kids? If we teach them to have healthy relationships, to be supportive of each other, why wouldn't we assume that that can help some, address some of the downstream issues we're struggling to figure out today? So anyway, I'm happy to be here and answer questions later as needed. Terrific. We will come back. Um, now let's go to Cynthia Germanata president and co-founder, Born This Way Foundation. Cynthia, you and your daughter have uh, established an absolutely phenomenal enterprise in support of empowering youth. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us about the foundation and what you do? Absolutely. I'd love to. And Katie and Sherry, thank you uh, for your words. Um, yes, I'm Cynthia Germanotta, president and co-founder of Born This Way Foundation, which I co-founded with my daughter, Stephanie, who many of you may know as Lady Gaga. But like um, Katie, I too am first and foremost a mom, um, not only of her, but of my other daughter, Natalie. And our story at Born This Way Foundation is very personal, uh, not only to her, but to our family, because it was born out of the struggles that she experienced as a young girl growing up uh, that many young people face. In her case, uh, it took what should have been a wonderful childhood experience, and she developed anxiety and depression at a very young age, uh, which later led to, to many things, um, you know, including uh, a lack of value you know, in herself, uh, destructive behavior, many things that she has spoken about. And as I'll fast forward, because as her career took off, she would start talking about her experiences to young people. She was brave enough to share her story. And as a parent, I didn't quite understand that in the beginning, but I came to realize that she was healing and young people were healing and feeling empowered. And they were, you know, Gaga, how did you do it? Like, we heard so many similar stories as we traveled the country that resonated with us. And these young people wanted to be part of a solution they were very aspirational. They wanted a better world. They wanted it to change. And that was really, that organic relationship between her and her fans was what gave birth to the foundation. And her vision um, was creating a generation that's better equipped to deal with their struggles than she was. I mean, we think of it as actually putting the control of one's mental wellness and one's resilience in the hands of young people. And that's what we set out to do. I, you know, I said to her, it, that's a, an incredible goal, but that's a daunting mission because it's behavior change, it's cultural shift, it's probably a multi-decade um, journey. Uh, but her message to me was, well, mom, if somebody you know, if it was easy, somebody would have done it already. So uh, fast forward now, you know, to the foundation. That's what we do, you know, each and every day. And the way that we do that is through working with partners um, to enable young people, to empower them and inspire them to build this kind of world. And we do that uh, by inviting uh, conversations, uh, supportive conversations around mental health with the aim of eliminating the stigma uh, we connect young people to resources in their communities. Uh, we conduct uh, extensive research as well. 
and we work within communities to build kind communities that foster the wellness and the resilience of young people. Uh, so that primarily is our mission. As she says, I want to make kindness cool, validate the emotions of young people all over the world, and eliminate the stigma um, around mental health. Um, when it comes to res resiliency, um, you know, I, I think we know from our research it certainly is something that can be developed, but it's a complicated road um, to building that. Uh, it's very much connected to mental health and the, the well-being of a youth. Uh, one in four young people develop a mental health issue by the time they're 14, and the, the balance of mental health issues are developed by the time a young person is 24. So the younger that we can reach them, um, to Sherry's point, that one through five um, age group is incredibly important, uh, the younger uh, that we can, uh, can start working with young people. So um, that is our mission and our goal. I'm very excited to be here to talk with, uh, with everyone. Uh, on this important issue. Cynthia, thank you. <clears throat> and now to someone who is not in your program, uh, we're thrilled to have Ted Bunch with us. Ted is co-founder of A Call to Men, which educates men all over the world with the goal of promoting male authenticity and promoting uh, or preventing all forms of discrimination against women and girls as well as other oppressed groups. So. Ted, we're ha happy to have you Thank with you. Us. I'm glad to be here. Thank you. Thank you all very much for your comments. Good afternoon. Um, so A Call to Men is a national organization. Our work is around prevention. We want to go upstream so all the things that were mentioned here don't happen. Um, our mission is to create a world where all men and boys are loving and respectful and all women and girls are valued and safe. We've been in existence as a not-for-profit for about 17 years now. I'm the co-founder and the chief development officer. There were so many things said today um, that I want to respond to um, <clears throat> because um, the anecdote is really around healthy, respectful manhood in so many ways. When we talk about violence and verbal abuse and physical abuse, we talk about resiliency with our boys, emotional learning, all of those things. Our boys are really in a difficult position and we pass this down from generation to generation to generation, these rigid notions of manhood that are harming women and girls and also men and boys and those who don't conform to a binary or in the LGBTQ, trans, gender non-conforming individuals. I'm also a parent, six children, from 29, the oldest, uh, my daughter, to 17. Three are biological and three are adopted. We have the United Nations, we have uh, two white children and four African American children. And um, so I, I'm, I'm witnessing things not only in the work that we do, but in my own home. Uh, I also have my youngest son came out at 15 as gay. He's 17 now. We're celebrating him for it. It's changed our life as far as what true authenticity is. Um, and it's, uh, I smile every time because I'm really uh, excited about him and, and him embracing and loving who he is. We've been waiting for him. Um, so I'd like to show a quick video if I could, and then I'd just make a couple more comments. Um, it's the Call to Men video. When I was a little kid, I was really good at just being me. But I grew distant from my true feelings. I was shaped by what society expected from me. Holding on to my masculine traits because they were encouraged. I lost sight of my more sensitive qualities. I became disconnected from myself and then disconnected from others. I was taught to be in control of everything around me. No, come over here. No, oh, come this way. And that girls were not my equal. devastating effects on my life and those around me. I responded to stress with anger. I hid my emotions. I felt the need to dominate and control others. No, no, no. listen to what I'm telling you. I know what I'm talking about. All of which was bad for my health. I reject those rigid notions of manhood. 
I never use violence. I value women, girls, and non-binary people. I speak out against injustice. Healthy manhood makes me happier and healthier. Now I'm more in touch with my emotions. I just feel a whole lot better. I value and respect all people. Healthy manhood prevents problems in my community. I can be myself. I can express my version of masculinity. I can create a world where all men and boys are loving and respectful and all women and girls are valued and safe. Thank you. Um, so this is our work. We really work to address the promote healthy and respectful manhood. As we do that, we de decrease, as we increase and, and promote a healthy and respectful manhood, we also decrease and prevent domestic violence, sexual assault, bullying, homophobia. It all goes away. These rigid notions of manhood are really harming uh, all of us. So uh, we do this really in a way uh, from um, middle school and high school curriculum we have. We, we wrote with Scholastic doing very well around the country, also in the UK and in Kenya, called uh, Live Respect, one word, coaching healthy and respectful manhood. We also work with colleges, um, while professional sports, we've been in front of all of the teams from hockey, NHL, and NFL, NBA, Major League Soccer, Major, Major League Baseball. Um, we're there on a yearly basis. After we trained all the players, we also then go and do the rookies every year, so everyone has this information. Um, we're in corporate America dealing with sexual harassment in the workplace, um, military, law enforcement, first responders, really wherever there's men and boys is where we are. Uh, we go from the barbershop to the boardroom. And we really address the issue of the collective socialization of manhood. We've coined a phrase called the man box. It's an abbreviated version of what we're re referencing to, that we have to always be in control, right? We have to always, uh, the quality associated with power and control, not asking for help, right? Um, um, not be too kind. These are the messages that our boys get, right? Not as showing emotion except for what emotion? Anger. Anger, right? So our boys, when we tell that little boy to stop, f stop um, crying, we're also telling him to stop feeling. And this is where we don't get to learn. These boys don't get to learn all of who they are. You know, I can get together with a group of men and, you know, we'll hang out all day. We'll talk about sports. We'll talk about the job. And we might talk about our kids. And, but we haven't gone deep. We haven't gone on any deep level. And our boys don't know to do that. So when you talk about asking for help when they're having challenges in school or when they're needing help with maybe a bully, they're not asking for help. They're running from that. They're withdrawing from it. Um, they're uh, um, not really uh, able to embrace their full, authentic self. And this is not an indictment on manhood, actually. It's an invitation for us to do things differently. I just want to talk about our curriculum real briefly, this Live Respect curriculum, because someone brought up some statistics around um, uh, damage to our girls around sexual assault in particular. In our curriculum, we surveyed the country Boys, their parents look just like you in the audience, all the boys in high school. So there are boys. I don't want you to think that it's a certain group, a certain economic group, a certain race. It's all of our boys. We ask them a couple things, high school boys. We ask them, do you know what consent is? 19% of our boys knew what consent was. 81% could not define, could, could not define consent. Your sons, I'm talking about. We don't have the conversations with our boys. If I ask a group of fathers, when should your daughters have sex, what do they say to me? <laughs> Never. <laughs> if I ask them when their sons have sex, well, you know, what's, yeah. what's the offer? Right. right. If he's going to college a virgin, hmm, is everything all right with my son? We can't have it both ways. We don't have those conversations. So those boys don't know what consent is, which explains sexual assault in the military. It explains sexual assault on college campuses. It explains why the girls you mentioned between 16 and 24 at the highest rate for being sexually assaulted, because our boys think no means try harder, because we've taught them that. I'm talking about us, the good guys. We're giving them the same message. 
because we distance, uh, we teach our boys to distance themselves from the experience of girls except for sex. Mm -hmm. And that experience of girls, meaning emotions, being kind, uh, uh, expressing your feelings, all of those things we want to, we put that down. That's outside of the man box, right? We want these rigid notions of manhood to be inside the man box. And there's some wonderful things, being a provider, protector, all of those things are great, but women do that very well also. So this type of teaching, this belief, when we just pass it down from generation to generation, the male dominance, and it stops our boys from asking for help, and it also oppresses our girls. And we grow up to be men who die six years earlier than women from stress-related illnesses, by the way. <laughs> you know, yeah. Because we keep stuffing it, keep putting it away, keep putting it away. We never express it. We ask those same boys, and I'll, then I'll turn it back over to you, Drew. Mm -hmm. We ask those same boys, these are good kids now. If you're having sex with a girl, we, we presented it as a girl, and she says she wants to stop, can she? 41% said no. Where are they learning that? These are, these are our kids. They said no. 41%. So this man box teaches us that women and girls have less value than men and boys. That's, a, that's, our, that's our conditioning. It's not, in, it's not in a, embedded in our DNA. It's embedded in our socialization. These things are not true, of course, but that's what it's taught, right? We tell that boy, you got to throw her on that, so you throw like a, right? How do you know the answer to that? Well, girls, of course, girls throw just fine, but what does that six-year-old boy take away from that? That girls are equal to him or less than him? Less than, and we do these things all the time. So the issue of less value is something we're all taught. We pass it down. Good, well-meaning men pass it down, myself included, not anymore, but my generation of men, that women, and girl, well, that women are the property of men and that girls and women are sexual objects. Those are three things that are part of that man box. And those are the things that we interrupt and promote a healthy, respectful manhood and teach about healthy relationships and what mutual respect is and that you can have girls as friends and it doesn't have to be about the conquest. Um, so all of these things tie into resiliency for our boys because they want to be tough. They don't want to have to ask for help. They want to just deal with it and suck it up because if they, if they don't, then they see that they, they think they're falling short on this manhood that we've imposed on them. So those, those are the things we challenge. And such important work. Thank, thank, you. thank you very much. And finally, um, the Surgeon General of the State of California. I have uh, reserved Dr. Nadine Burke Harris to be last because she deals with a little different scope of the issue that we're confronting today. We are up against major issues as a society in striving to develop resilient youth and we're eager to hear what you have to say about what are the concerns and what are the approaches we need to be worried about. Sure, so um, before uh, two months ago, when I was appointed by the governor to be the, the first Surgeon General of the state of California, I was in the role of pediatrician, researcher, and advocate. And specifically, I was looking at the issue of adverse childhood experiences and how they affect health and well-being over the lifetime. And uh, I came into that role uh, from, you know, just in my job as a pediatrician and observing that the kids I was caring for the, the ones who were having the, the most challenges, both in terms of mental and behavioral health and well-being, and in terms of their you know, physical health and chronic diseases, were also the ones who were experiencing the highest level of stress and trauma and adversity. And that really led me to the groundbreaking research that was done by the CDC and Kaiser Permanente, which was the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study, where they looked at 10 categories of stressful or traumatic issues in childhood. Those include physical, emotional, and sexual abuse, physical or emotional neglect, or growing up in a, in a household where a parent was mentally ill, substance dependent, incarcerated, where there was parental separation or divorce, uh, or domestic violence. And what this groundbreaking study found was just two things. Number one is that these things were incredibly common, right? Two thirds of folks had experienced at least one. One in eight folks had experienced four or more of these 10 adverse childhood experiences. And the, uh, the second thing that they found was that the more someone had experienced, the greater the risk to their health. Right, so there was this dose response relationship. And not just the stuff that you would expect, that folks who had four more adverse childhood experiences 
were four and a half times as likely to be depressed, mm -hmm. were 12 times as likely in that study to attempt suicide, right? But they were also twice as likely to develop heart disease mm -hmm. and two and a half times as likely to have a stroke. Right? And so the, the subsequent body of research that has come out in the past two decades around adverse childhood experiences helps us to identify a couple of critical things, which is that there are, two th there are a couple of like really critical mechanisms by which this happens, which is number one, the activation of the stress response, right? Or this, the fight or flight response. There's a whole bunch of like fancy, science behind it, which I love because I'm a total science nerd. Um, but we now understand pretty well a lot of the pathways that are activated, the release of stress hormones like adrenaline and cortisol, right? So you have this big release of stress hormones, right? But the other thing that's absolutely critical, the other key ingredient is that, all right, so my, my husband and I have four boys. Mm. And when something happens to one of our boys, if they get hurt or injured or something scary happens, as a mom, like, what's the, what's the first thing that I do? What's the first thing we do? You run over, you give them a hug, you say it's going to be okay, right? And when we do that, it actually releases hormones in our kid's body, right, to turn off that stress response. So what we find is that the individuals who have the worst outcomes are the ones who have either chronic adversity, so high doses of adversity, right? Severe adversity, right? Um, and inadequate buffering caregiving systems, right? So either the adversity is so high that it is overcomes the, 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 the buffering that we would give, um, or the buffering just isn't there um, at all. Mm -hmm. And um, and so that leads to this overactive stress response system, which is what leads to uh, many of these health and behavioral consequences. And so as a, as a doctor, I, for me, it was really critically important to put that into practice. And so we started in, um, in, in my professional practice, we started screening for adverse childhood experiences. Uh, because the data shows us that early detection and early intervention improves outcomes. And just as we understand that cumulative adversity is the greatest risk factor, right? The thing that has me so jazzed as I'm sitting up here on this panel is that the cumulative doses of buffering and nurturing caregiving systems also add up. And what we hear is that, you know, our kids are getting some from Sesame Street, some from One Low Foundation, some from Born This Way, some, you know, like all of these different places where the, the more sources, environmental sources of healing, nurturing, safe, stable, and nurturing relationships and environments, right, the better uh, off our kids are. And I, I'll just um, end with a, just like a quick anecdote, uh, particularly when it comes to building resilience and the health of our young people. One of the things that I have seen in my clinical practice, and it happens, uh, um, and, I, and I think that it happens on a large scale, is that for the young people, because of who, for whom, because of what they've experienced, their biology has somehow changed right? They may have an overactive stress response system, and they are feeling that, they're experiencing that, and they're showing the symptoms of it. Oftentimes, they wonder to themselves, what's wrong with me, mm -hmm. right? And then they have the second hit of not only having this experience, but then judging themselves for this experience or someone else judging them for the experience. And this is why raising awareness and a lot of the, the work that's happening from the folks on this panel is so critically important because I was in clinic um, a couple of years ago, seeing a young man, and I said to him, uh, you know, I, I was screening him for adverse childhood experiences. He had a pretty high score. And I said, you know, so, you know, because of what you've experienced, I, I think your body may be making more stress hormones than, the, than it should. And this can look or feel like being quick to anger, getting overwhelmed easily, uh, feeling sick, e getting sick easily when you're feeling overwhelmed, or having difficulty controlling your impulses. Any of those sound familiar for you? And he was like, oh yeah, I get hot quick. Right, I get hot quick. And I said, that's fantastic. That is your, your body stress response is doing what it was designed to do. 
but because of the experiences you've had, it works a little too, a little, a little better than it should. It's a little overactive. And so here's what we're going to do. When you are f having those experiences, right, we're going to, th there are a couple things that the research shows make a difference. Sleep, exercise, nutrition, mindfulness, mental health, and healthy relationships, right? So we're going to double down on each of those things. And for him, it was playing basketball. For other folks, it's connecting with healing and healthy relationships, right? And being able to recognize the relationships that activate your stress response, right? Versus the, the relationships that are, that are healing and nurturing from the inside out. So here in California, we're now moving towards as, um, strengthening that system, doing uh, universal screening for individuals on Medicaid for, who, for adverse childhood experiences, and doing what the data shows, which is early detection and early intervention and supporting, nurturing, and buffering. And Dr. Burke Harris has just given you a glimpse of the advantages that we have in resilient science today because of the methodology it has improved so tremendously. So thank you. We're going to uh, talk now just quickly about some successes and some challenges. And I'm not going back in order. I'm going to start with Cynthia. <laughs> you want to talk with us a little bit about, you know, what do you consider to be a success? How do you measure it? Um, and give us an example of one, or an example of a, a major challenge that you faced in your work. No, absolutely. I mean, I, I think some of the greatest successes that we've had involve young people. It involves their ideas, it involves their engagement and their creation uh, of both campaigns and programs that we have, uh, because it's very empowering to them. Um, one example that I could give you is uh, a recent program that we're now piloting called Teen Mental Health First Aid. Um, everybody's heard of first aid, right, or CPR. I call this CPR for the mind. And what it does is it teaches high school students how to recognize, identify, and respond to somebody that's either in a mental health crisis or a substance abuse crisis. And uh, it's not diagnostic in nature, but as you know, we know from our research that when a young person is in crisis, they're more likely to turn to a peer uh, than a parent. They may turn to a parent if it's a safety issue, but they're more likely to, to turn to a peer, but the peer only knows so much in information in terms of, of how to help them. Um, so we're involved in this initiative with um, a great partner, which is the National Council for Behavioral Health. Uh, they have had a training program called Mental Health First Aid that has trained well over a million people um, around the country. And this is now the teen version that we have co-developed together. Uh, we're now piloting uh, in eight schools. We've trained 2,500 um, young people so far. Uh, we are extremely excited about it. And the feedback that we're getting from the young people is also you know, equally exciting. Um, some of the challenges that come with that is you know, we work quite often with corporations, many types of partners, that we firmly believe that young people should be part of and empowered with the movement that we are, that we are on uh, and with creating that. And not everybody we encounter feels that they should be at the table. I mean, we often see programs and campaigns developed in a vacuum, and a young person was not present in that. So for us, it's vitally important to, uh, to listen to young people. Uh, they are not one size fits all. I mean, they have very, very different backgrounds, situations, uh, experiences, struggles. So listening to them and really understanding their needs, because, I mean, you know, um, Ms. Burke, from your work, the, the um, diversity of challenges and what might work for one child doesn't work for, for another child. So that um, is incredibly important to us. Um, also, sometimes success for us, we see it, and sometimes we don't. Uh, there is uh, such an enormous... Um, suicide crisis, as you know, I mean, 800,000 people die per year from suicide, many of which are, are young people. I cannot tell you the number of donations that we receive at Born This Way Foundation that are in memory 
of someone's child. Um, in lieu of gifts, in lieu of flowers, that is what they want, is they want to donate to Born This Way Foundation. So we don't always you know, know the successes. Many, many times that we do, because there's also the incredible stories that we hear, um, uh, you know, but, but not often. Uh, I think some of the other challenges are resources and children having access to resources. We also know from our research that close to 90% of young people um, place a very high priority on their mental wellness, but half of them don't talk about it, and probably just as many, another half, don't know where to go. They don't know what the resources are. So we're spending a lot of our time in that space, is finding those resources. And the issues with those are cost associated with those resources, sometimes a lack of trust. Young people don't know about these resources, so they don't trust them. That's why they talk to their peers. Um, and also the stigma that still remains with, with talking about uh, mental health. And any pros and cons of having a celebrity face for your foundation you um, want to mention? Yes, absolutely. Um, I'm going to say mostly pro for two reasons. One is when this started, um, Stephanie was 25. She's 33 year, years old now. And one of the things that a lot of our partners said was, wow, she can make decades-long impact in this space because this to her is the most important thing in her life, the thing that's, that she's most um, passionate about. Um, and she was just a kid too. You know, I didn't, you know, when you have a child like that that reaches that level at a young age, I would kind of forget because she has a, a maturity level about her. But I would say to my husband, oh my God, she's a kid too. And she's telling her stories and it's really resonating, you know, with, with other people. So yes, you know, and I'm sorry, you had a question? No, not at all. But oh, okay. the huge, huge impact of celebrity role models when they can step out and have the right messaging. So I think you're very advantaged also. No, thank you. Reason. Yeah, and, I, and yeah. I feel that because she shares her stories so openly um, with young people that many would come to her concert as much to hear her message as they were coming to hear the music because it was very real to them and they were feeling empowered and, and learning from it. Can I just please, interrupt and throw something do. in there though? I think one of the things that's really, really important about this circumstance is that this is, she's not like, didn't just show up as a spokesperson. It's not like there's a foundation who was like, hey, right. can we get someone to get right. out there and put out right. there? It's clear that it resonates, like this is her heart and soul and this is what she's expressing. Right. And I think that, makes a tremendous difference in how it's received. Absolutely. Yeah. All yeah. the way from the name of the foundation. Well, well thank you. But along with right. that, I mean, she too um, has anxiety and depress mm -hmm. depression mm -hmm. to this day um, is treated for it. So she came from a, a place of really understanding. Right. Very good. Uh, Sherry, we're coming back to you okay. now. A little bit about a success story you could share with us. Um, absolutely. So I think when I think about the successes in our work, particularly in trying to help children cope with traumatic um, experiences, I would say the fact that I mentioned earlier that Sesame very deliberately tries to engage adults, it's why there were celebrities, Muppets, humor, parodies, um, is that we find when we're going in um, communities with particularly vulnerable families. And again, what we'll do is partner with our direct service um, providers like Nurse Family Partnership. They're going in for home visits where families, where young mothers with all sorts of um, challenging circumstances are helping their children. And we find that by creating the Sesame content and the training of our direct service partners, we not only increase recruitment. I mean, they'll say that, you know, if you're 16 and a mom struggling, um, your child does have um, a number of adverse childhood experiences, you may not have the, the same enlightenment or wherewithal to understand that, that more engagement, more play is exactly what that child needs. And I think it's both that Sesame Street content is less intimidating or maybe they grew up on it themselves. So we find that it increases recruitment of the families we're trying to serve and also increases the engagement of the adult with the child. So if you think about it, think of the Sesame content as not just the tool for the child, but the catalyst for that critical 
engagement. When Nadine says, if you scoop your child up and hug them, of course they feel better. But there are so many children experiencing ongoing stressful situations where no one is there to help um, relieve that, that literally hormonal reaction. Um, the other thing I would say that I think is Sesame Street has a unique ability to do, and I have a clip I can show here, is a lot of people, you've talked about stigma and reducing stigma. So when you talk about giving characters, um, giving children characters where they can identify, feel less alone, but also to show adults, to show others um, issues from the perspective of a child. Think how many issues, homelessness is the one I'm going to use. If you think of the 2.5 children in America now are growing up experiencing homelessness. And when you think of homelessness, what do you think of? You probably think of a man on the street. So many people don't think of the impact on children or from a child's perspective. Incarceration, you think of incarceration, you don't necessarily think of the impact on children. So I will share a clip. Um, this is part of a larger program around helping um, families, helping caregivers, helping uh, social service organizations deal with children experiencing homelessness. But by creating a character named Lily, who is experiencing homelessness, we're also able to raise awareness, reduce stigma, and I'll, I'll show you this clip to give you a sense. Mm -hmm. Hello. Very nice, you. Sherry. Thank because you. Because I love you. Because I love you. Uh, <laughs> I have to make you watch it again. And, and uh, Katie, we're coming to you. Yeah. Quick. I'll say successes really yeah. quickly. I think um, I had no idea how much kids want to talk about this subject. Like you put these, you put fictional, I, and also I want to say the power of fictional film um, instead of lecture. And really to the point about talking to kids, like they start talking about the characters and before you know it, they're talking about their lives and they're showing empathy to each other and you can watch them in a circle recalibrating their sense of what normal is. It's a success to realize that what we're doing is not rocket science. Most kids inside them have a gut sense for what's healthy and unhealthy. They've never had a session and a forum to talk to each other about it. So I think we use the term first aid as well. Um, if we can mobilize communities, which we are, we're at 650,000 kids educated through in-person workshops in the last four and a half years, and that number was 250,000 a year ago and 100,000 the year before that. What we're, and that is all organic growth. We don't, I used to work for Michael J. Fox, so I know the power of celebrity. We have none of that. All we have is a program kids want and educators saying they are paying attention to this in a different way. So I think the opportunities are great. The challenges are the stigma. We all, I think we all go to a safe place where we like to think this happens to other people who don't look like us and it's not our problem to solve. And I think we have for too long thought about this as a soft issue when it's just not. If you look at your business lives, your work lives, your family lives, the healthiness of your relationship and building those skills to be healthy, there's probably nothing more important than life. And I'm not minimizing reading and writing and arithmetic. I'm not <laughs> minimizing that. But when it comes to healthy lives, I think that um, we have to stop avoiding this issue and owning it, and really being more proactive in how we arm our kids around it. Ted, one minute. Yep. Uh, so I would just really reinforce what um, was just said by both of you, really, around the safe space that's needed. There's just a space that's needed for our children to talk about things that they're going through, to provide that space. And we've done that in, in all kinds of ways. Um, but I do want to just say that we went into a college to do a training to a um, fraternity and some college leaders. They then adopted a high school in their community and talked to them about healthy relationships and dating and healthy dating. Uh, and, uh, and then that high school in the same community adopted a middle school to talk about boundaries and respect and that kind of thing. So, so that's a real success story. That sounds wonderful. And finally, uh, Dr. Burke Harris. I would say um, it, probably the biggest, uh, most exciting success really was when California passed Assembly Bill 340 requiring Absolutely. Uh, routine screening for adverse childhood experiences. That was huge. And then the governor's support of it. I think in terms of challenges, the interesting thing is that um, I think uh, oftentimes uh, a lot of these challenges are uh, identified late, and so we're we're identifying, you know, with doctors mm -hmm. on the front lines, but. Um, Somehow we make this distinction between what happens above the neck and what happens below the neck, right? Right, and and the body doesn't do that. So really cross-pollinating these conversations, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Very, very well put. And 
recognizing that all of these systems fit together from internal systems to individuals to families to stronger communities to a stronger world. And uh, I want to thank our panelists and thank all of you for being with us this afternoon. Uh, please join me.